a criminal street hood seeks redemption on the battlefields of France. McBride was only a half-pipe gangster in khaki, but a giant in courage when he finally decided to bump off the German army. You're listening to Pulp Reader. But first, a word from our sponsor. Whether you are 16 or up to 50, prepare for a good wartime job with a peacetime future. Trained electrical men are needed now. It's not how young you are or how old you are. The question is, have you the training to hold a good wartime job today and to ensure your future after the war? Learn electricity in 12 weeks. It's easy and practical. Our pay tuition after graduation plan enables you to start right away and pay your tuition in easy payments when finished. Send for a free book of facts. No obligation. No salesman will call. Coin Electrical School, 500 South Paulina Street, Department 8378, Chicago, Illinois, USA. And now, on with the show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the show. This is the Pulp Reader Podcast. Thanks for giving us a listen. I'm your host, Bobby Deluxe, and we are back after a bit of a hiatus. And all I really want to say about that is sometimes, hey, life just gets in the way. But we are back, and after this episode, we should be back on a normal production schedule. So an episode, hopefully every week, but we're shooting for every two weeks for a new episode. So the way it works here is I pluck a story from an old pulp magazine, and I give it my best dramatic reading. Today's story takes us to the unflinching battlefields of France. It's our first war story on Pulp Reader. So without any further ado, please enjoy Gangster in Khaki from Fawcett's Battle Stories number 64, published in 1934 and written by Llewellyn Hughes. Back some considerable distance from the front line, a regiment was resting from its labors. More than half of its officers, NCOs, and men had gone to pay the bill for Chateau Terry. But now, at midnight, on the fourth day's relief from fighting, they were numerically up to strength again by reason of the newly arrived replacements. Up ahead, in the murky dark of a summer night, Chateau Terry lay mutilated and silent. But along the Paris Metz Road ammunition and supply trains went at full gallop, for the German artillerymen were spraying that important highway with shrapnel and explosives, frantic crashes that reverberated through the still, damp air in a series of sickening waves. Bursts of hot, shrieking metal splashed out of the night in the most disconcerting fashion, landing anywhere. Camions bringing the expected replacements were ordered to unload farther down the road. Squads came up over the dark terrain in single file. It was a lively baptism for lads who not many months ago had been wearing Oxfords and fedoras. At almost any hour, the fighting qualities of the regiment would again be called upon. Gaunt men and youths who already had fought in the Valley of Death, fought and lived to tell the tale, would soon be mustered again and, with the fresh replacements, would set off up the road, creep through the waving wheat, branch across fields, and before the light of morn revealed their position, they would be lined up in front of a patch of trees, a small wood. Only GHQ and the divisional and brigade commanders knew the name of that wood, its precise position, and the toll of lives that would be exacted before it was in American hands. They had studied the situation on their maps. Two kilometers west of Chateau Terry was a hill called Hill 204. To the north, over other hills, small patches of woods, ravines, and a network of fulsome trenches was Borichet's. About one kilometer west of Borichet's was Lucie Le Bocage, and between these two shell-torn hamlets was the southern edge of a patch of timber, a narrow belt about three-quarters of a mile long. It was called Bellow Wood. War and its trumpet call to the colors brings together men from widely separated towns and districts, brings together, perhaps coincidentally, men who once were friends and who for various reasons have strayed apart and become lost to one another, brings together lifelong enemies and those who have good cause to hate. Often they might meet again in the same brigade, often in the same regiment, and sometimes actually in the same company, and possibly, by nature of illness, reason of adversity or forgetfulness, one man is unrecognizable to the other. In the rude shelter that was the company's dugout, a captain sat on an empty ammunition box, cleaning his army revolver. His name was Rawson, and the men subject to his commands called him Rawhide Rawson, because of his brusque manner his cold, harsh voice, the severity of his hard features, and his toughness and durability under fire. 
The shape of his mouth, closed lips that formed a short, straight line, the ice blue of the man's eyes, the grave, pale face that was never creased by a smile, all suggested a man embittered, a man for whom life held little pleasure. An unhappy love affair, a disappointment in business, it might have been either. Anyway, it was evident that Captain Rawson had a deep-rooted grudge against someone or something. An inconsequence, his company had become thoroughly hardened under his training, had in fact become a rip-roaring, smashing force of fighting men, asking no quarter and giving none. With him in the dugout was a young, thin-faced lieutenant. He had been watching Captain Rawson, studying him as the man absently cleaned his revolver, and he wondered what it was that occasioned such bitter expression, the revengeful thrust of the granite-like jaw, the premature gray above the temples, and a forehead so noble in its breadth and height. "'What's the trouble, Captain?' he asked quietly. "'Thinking of the old days? Back home?' Captain Rawson switched his head round, switched it, as though it were on a pivot, like a machine gun. What? he said. Thinking of what? No, what the hell's the use of that? We're out here to fight the Germans, aren't we? Not to sentimentalize about the past. The curt rebuff to a diffident and friendly overture made the young, thin-faced lieutenant flush. But all he said was, Yeah, I guess you're right about that, Captain. You guess I'm right? You know I'm right. This is no place to be petticoat-dreaming or thinking of the days back home. He sprang his revolver with a vicious snap. Forget all that bunk, he said. We'll be trekking back up that road before morning. The young, thin-faced lieutenant sat bolt upright. Back into the line? Before morning? Why, we've only been out here four days. Haven't had time to... Silent a moment, he said. Where are we headed for this time, Captain? Where are we headed for? What do you think? The enemy, of course. That's where we're headed, wherever we happen to find them. A corporal came down the dugout steps. The last load of them replacements, sir. They had some casualties amongst them coming up here. Any better than the other bunch? Can't rightly see them in the dark, sir. Kind of scared looking. Reckon they got shelled all the way from Rockland Court. All right. See they got some chow, and don't let them bunk up together. Separate the lifelong buddies, the lambs from the goats, and distribute them among the old-timers. Got the idea? Yes, sir. Two hours later, the company commanders were summoned to the battalion dugout. Tomorrow evening, as soon as it got dark enough, the battalion would move up the line again, back to hell and glory. They would get further directions as to their objectives from an officer stationed to meet them in Borriche. And so it was that late the following afternoon, a company stood lined up for inspection in a sunken road back of Chateau Thierry. Captain Rawson was reviewing his new replacements, men who were about to go into battle. In quiet words, he told them a few things for the good of their souls. With a cold, keen eye, he looked each man over from head to heel. Suddenly, as he walked down the column, he stiffened in front of a little rat-eyed individual whose mouth was twisted and whose uniform hung loosely from the frame of his narrow shoulders. Cruelty, cunning, and apprehension predominated his furtive, dead-white face. "'What's your name?' The man hesitated the fraction of a second. Then he said, "'McBride, sir.' The captain stared at him, stared hard. "'That your real name?' he sneered. "'Or the name you enlisted under?' Again the man hesitated. "'I've told you what my name is. "'Where were you drafted?' "'Jersey City.' The captain continued to subject him to a close scrutiny. Ever in Graydon, Illinois? he asked savagely. There was a flutter of McBride's eyelids, the pupils of his sharp little eyes contracted. Was I ever in Graydon, Illinois? he repeated slowly. That's what I asked you. No, nah, I never even heard of that place, Cap. Quite sure of that? Private McBride shifted. Say, he retaliated daringly, curling his lower lip. What is all this? Some more of this army third degree stuff or something? You heard me, didn't you? Captain Ross intensed the sinews of his neck. His eyes were brilliant as he attempted to control himself. He switched his head round. Corporal, he called. Take this man down to my dugout. Keep him there till I get back. The company was dismissed. They would fall in again at six o'clock, in marching order. Any man who wanted to smoke had better get it all over with before then. With a set face, Captain Rawson strode militantly in the direction of the company dugout. 
He dismissed the corporal, took one swift look at the young, thin-faced lieutenant sitting over in the corner, then turned his attention to Private McBride. For a while, he studied him in silence. "'You measly, sniveling little runt!' he suddenly swore. "'I've been waiting for this moment. I swore to God that if I ever met you again, I'd take the law into my own hands and break every bone in your body.' Realizing that something unusual was happening, the young lieutenant got to his feet and came closer. The captain looked at him. "'Stand at the foot of those steps,' he ordered tensely. "'Stop anybody from coming down here. I want to talk to this man without being interrupted.' McBride hadn't moved. Furtive eyes followed the captain as he went to the back of the table and sat down. A candle waxed to a broken slat that was stuck into the clay of the wall illuminated Rawson's gray, stone-like features. Come here, he rasped. Come here where I can see you. The man obeyed, came forward with shuffling steps, stood there, his arms at his sides. McBride, eh? Yep. And never in Graden, Illinois? You heard me. I told you I never even heard of the place. Never heard of it, huh? All right. Take a good look at me. Maybe that'll help you. Ever seen me before? No, sir. Haven't, huh? With the sweep of his arm, the captain yanked off his steel helmet. There was a scar on his forehead that extended upwards into his hair. He pointed to it. See this? he snarled. Does this remind you of anything? Or have you conveniently forgotten that, too? Does that remind you of the time you held me up and grabbed that payroll? Just a little over a year ago, in Graydon, Illinois? McBride shifted nervously, cleared his throat. Uh, looks like you got me mixed up with some other guy, Cap. I haven't got you mixed up with anybody. You're the thug that held me up a little over a year ago in Graydon. Rawson, flinging the accusation at him, betrayed an undercurrent of intense emotional feeling. You're that gunman that backed me up against the factory wall, robbed me of my payroll, then smashed me over the head without giving me a chance to defend myself. Uh, you got me all wrong, Cap. Who's been stringing you, huh? The tone of McBride's denial was growing fainter. "'I haven't got you wrong,' said Rawson bitterly. "'I know you, all right. "'I couldn't forget that face of yours, that dopey look in your eye, "'that hangdog expression round the corners of your mouth, "'a stick-up, a lousy little thug, and a snowbird or whatever they'd call you. "'Thugs like you have got to dope yourself up before you find the guts to go through with anything. "'I enlisted, didn't I?' I come over here, didn't I? I'm ready to take my chances along with the rest of you, ain't I? He was beginning to stammer a little. His small, rat-like face was thrust forward in a forced pugnacity. In the foreground of war, within reach of its overwhelming destructiveness, within sound of its cannon, high explosive and racket of death, Private McBride looked woefully small and puny. I'm ready to do my share along with the rest of you, ain't I? Then... In a whimpering tone, charged with a slight show of retaliation, he said, "'So what the hell are you picking on me for?' Captain Rawson, still keeping his eyes on him, moistened his pale, dry lips. "'Why am I picking on you?' he sneered. "'I'll tell you. Back in Graden, I built up a business for myself. It took years. Then, like a prowling rat, you happened along. Your business was robbery and murder, taking what other people had slaved for honestly.' When you grabbed that payroll, you put me back ten years. I had to sell my house. I had to... Hell. The captain was trembling now. His huge hands clenched, unclenched, and clenched again. Private McBride stood there in front of him in a posture of utter helplessness, at once pathetic, meager, and guilty. He said nothing. Ever since that day, I've been on the lookout for you. And now... He laughed. I had to meet you here, over in France... Both of us wearing the same uniform. You, one of the men in my company. There was a silence. Well, that won't stop me, he said. You're in the army now, and I guess I can keep my eye on you. Let's see how you'll shape out here, you runt. You'll be in action in twenty-four hours, and you won't have a gat in your hands. You'll have a bayonet. You'll find you won't be able to strike a man down while his back is turned. You'll find the Germans waiting for you, armed like yourself. And you won't find any dope to bolster up your courage, you little louse. You'll have to go into it on what you've got in that narrow little chest of yours. And that's a heart that's all shriveled up. A heart that's black with crime, all right? 
he shouted. Get out of here before I... Listen, Cap, get out, I tell you. What are you going to do? Be a heel and toss me in the brig or what? Give me a break, will you, Cap? Listen, you got me right. I'm the one that stuck you up, all right? I was all doped up at the time and... And... His voice trailed away. Listen, Cap, I'm off of that game for life. I'm sorry for what i done to you. Honest, I am. Get out of here, was the threat. I went crazy. That's how it was. Only I'm cured now since I've been in the army. You can believe it or not. But listen, Cap, I hope if I ever handle a gat again, I hope to God this mid of mine gets paralyzed. The stricken face of McBride, the gunman, looked into the stricken face of his company captain. That's talking, ain't it? And I mean every word of it, Cap. I'm through. I'm off of that crooked stuff for good. And I want to tell you right now, I'm real sorry. I was the cause of all that trouble that came to you. He whimpered, hanging his head. But Rawson had jumped to his feet. Get back to your squad, he roared. Get out there and be ready to march up the line. There's something in store for you, McBride. You're in the army now, and I'm going to see you get all that's coming to you. Under his slack uniform, a tremor of fear ran down Private McBride's thin legs. Turning unsteadily on them, he went up the steps. Lieutenant, said Rawson, you'll keep all this to yourself, understand? Cripes, Captain, was the sympathy. Now I understand. Certainly hard on you, all right. And it's tough. Meeting him right here that way. It's a wonder you didn't strangle him. I know I would have. I'd have killed him, damn thug. Give him the break he needs, muttered the captain. If the boys got to hear of it, they'd... And if I'm any judge of character, he'll need a buddy alongside him in the next 24 hours. The man's yellow. I can tell by his face. Gangsters always are. Unless they've got a gat in hand. Unless they're all doped up. They haven't the guts of a louse. That's how I figure him. He'll lie in a shell hole shivering with fear. And that, he concluded savagely will give me the opportunity I've been waiting for ever since that day in Graydon. I'll just put a bullet between his little eyes and I'll call it quits. Outside, in the gathering twilight, the men sat on the ground, waiting. There was nothing else to do. Private Wesson, a veteran by reason of two weeks fighting, interrogated the little white-faced replacement sitting next to him. What'd the cap have to say to you, buddy? W what? Private McBride stared and showed an anxious, frightened face. Aw, oh, he gave me a calling down about something. that That's all. Cripes, I deserved it, see? With a shaky hand, he produced a package of cigarettes. Here, buddy, help yourself to a smoke. Thanks. He's a tough hombre, Captain Rawson. Don't believe that guy cracked a smile in all his life. Kind-hearted and all that, and do anything for the lads in his company. He's a prince that way. But tough as they make him when it comes to discipline. Hold that match, buddy. But the light flickered and went out. Private Wesson offered his lighted cigarette. Here, buddy, light off this. McBride's spare, knotted fingers were trembling. Private Wesson noticed it and turned away. You ain't seen no fighting as yet, have you? He began. No, not yet I haven't. Boy, you got something coming to you. It's one hell of a picnic, all right. All right, that is, he hastily tempered. Until you get used to it. I ain't never gonna get used to it, soldier. There's one thing I'm sure of. Listen, said Private Wesson. Just don't give a damn, see? That's the only way. You gotta go through with it. See, same as me and the captain and everybody. We're in the army now. The whole mob of us. It don't make no difference unless you're a general or something. So what's the use? You gotta go through with it. Just don't give a damn, then you'll be all okay. Like me. See what I mean? If they get you, well, they get you. If they don't, well, maybe they're saving you up for the next time. So the best way is to not give a whoop. He spat. See what I mean, buddy? Uh, yeah, I, I I get you, all right. There was a silence. Write your girlfriend yet? No answer. I write mine. Told her I was feeling fine and dandy. Again, he spat. Listen, he said. You stick alongside, buddy. I'll show you the hang of it. Don't be scared. What's the use? Just don't give a whoop. That's all. Something contracted in Private McBride's throat. It closed tight. He wanted to reach over, grasp that friendly hand, if only to warm his own, and thank him. He wanted to tell him about his misguided upbringing. It all seemed so clear now. 
how he had run away from home to live in dives and sleep in barns and freight cars, how he had fallen in with a gang of thugs and had gone from bad to worse. But he said nothing. And half an hour later, he was trudging behind the man called Wesson, trudging on with quaking heart and eyes that showed their white, shivering to his very marrow, staggering on and on into an overwhelming and terrible something for which he was pitifully ill-qualified and ill-prepared. In the course of a battalion's advance up the line over a shell-drenched, torn and lacerated ground, across black fields nauseous with unfamiliar smells, under a steady downpour of rain that comes from a godforsaken sky, when milky flares splash horribly against the horizon, and you have a hard time keeping in touch with the man ahead of you, when the swish of shell goes by you, and bracketed with the explosion comes the cry of wounded men, when your world has turned to Hades, and your brain won't serve your muscle, that's the time to show the stuff that's in you. And it's one or two things then. You're either steel or putty. And the lad who comes through smiling, on steady legs, with eyes alight and unafraid, has proved himself. And in respect of courage, if in respect of nothing else, the day of judgment will not find him wanting. The company reached its position shortly after midnight. It was a narrow, shallow trench. The battalion holding it had been reduced to a platoon. They had won that trench, and lost, and won it all over again. Now it had to be held. Hold your ground to the last man, was the substance of divisional orders. There was another order delivered to Captain Rawson because of his leadership and gallant heart. It ran to the effect that he should try to establish his company in the north end of Bellow Wood and break up the enemy machine-gun positions there. Captain Rawson knew what this would mean, and for the time being he kept the news from his officers and men. Time enough when the dawn broke and they could see just where they were. "'How'd you feel now, buddy?' This from Private Wesson, lying in the shallow, water-filled trench. Orders were that there should be no talking, but the pouring rain drowned the sound of voices. In the pitch-dark, Private McBride's face was tortured. His eyes gleamed feverishly. "'Oh, hell,' he trembled. "'I don't give a damn what happens.' "'That's talking, buddy.' On the way up, the company had suffered heavily from enemy shellfire. Twenty-five of the new replacements never saw Bellow Wood. Some of them, civilians in Brooklyn and Jersey City a few weeks ago, were now on their way back there again, minus arms and legs. Dawn showed Captain Rawson his exact position. The north end of the wood was a hundred yards in front of them. The wood itself, thick with German machine guns, rose up drippingly, a phantom thing in the rain in pale gray fight like the ominous wraith of a pirate ship. About seven o'clock enemy shell fire began taking a further toll on them. The wounded were being taken back down a communication trench when, suddenly, the harsh cough of a machine gun started up. Private McBride, gripped by curiosity and fear, was trying to locate it. To his surprise, he noticed a little line of mud run his way. The next instant he felt something prick the flesh of his arm above the elbow. Automatically he ducked, shouted, "'Hit, buddy!' C cripes buddy i don't know he looked down at his left hand to his amazement it was running red cripes he repeated looks like i have been hit at that boy said private wesson you're lucky that's a passport to heaven beat it down the line soldier and give my love to the mamzelles back in some nice little belay where there ain't no lousy war beat it down the line private mcbride spoke as if he were cornered in a deliberate attack on his courage He'd shown him he was game. What do you think I am, a quitter? I'm going to see some fighting now I've come this far. His little pinched body was shaking violently. He was blowing through his twisted lips as though he had great difficulty in breathing. An order was passed along. Automatic rifles, fixed bayonets, hand grenades. The company would make a dash for the wood. Twenty-five yards, then down. Wait for the whistle. Then another twenty-five yards, and down again. Wait for the whistle once more then into the wood and fight like the devil. Wait for the signal. Captain Rawson had crawled along the trench to stiffen his men for the dash. He saw the blood running from Private McBride's hand. Here's a guy got it in the arm, and he won't quit, said Private Wesson. The captain glared at the casualty. You. He cursed him under his breath. So you helped yourself to a further lease of life, eh? All right, you little runt. Report to a dressing station as soon as we get into that wood, not before. The captain's lips barely moved. His face was a cast of frustrated revenge and hate. 
I ain't going down the line. Not for no man, see? You think I'm scared, don't you? Listen, Cap, I'm sticking with the show. Get that, will you? You'll do as I tell you, was the terse reply. Report to the nearest dressing station as soon as we establish ourselves in that wood. It was raining in torrents now. Through it, the spluttering bark of machine guns seemed vague and unreal. I ain't going down the line. I tell you, I'm going to take what's coming to me, along with the rest of you. He held up his arm. This ain't anything, he chattered wildly. I don't even feel it. I ain't afraid of their lousy machine guns. They can plug me again if it's coming to me. And I don't need no dope to go through with it, neither. Get that, Cap. He trembled. A whistle blew. In the rain, a thin, undulating wave of olive drab ran out, dipped and vanished. The racket in the woods became a confused and thundering roar. The thin wave rose again, undulated forward, disappeared. Private McBride ran out to join it. In the wood, rancid with foul smells, fetid with rotting bodies, infernal with the spit of rifle, burst of a hand grenade and shell, men sprang from tree to tree, rushed and tore from one boulder to another, and fought like gangsters and like animals tearing at each other's throats. Private Wesson was crouched behind a fair-sized boulder, and avoiding the crossfire from a particularly near and vicious machine gun, he had scraped the skin from his nose and cheek. He was not a pretty sight. Ahead of him, behind and to the right and left, grim-faced men were digging in and swearing vengeance. Something suddenly threw itself beside Private Wesson, flopped down beside him with a thud. A shower of machine-gun bullets splashed off the boulder and ricocheted amongst the trees. "'For the love of Pete!' said Private Wesson. "'You here again?' "'I'm here,' said Private McBride. "'Well, you must be nuts. That's all I gotta say. A guy that gets ordered down the line, a guy that's wounded, then turns round and comes out to a hellhole like this? He spat. Nuts, he concluded. Where is he? said Private McBride. Where's who? The captain. How should I know? Go find him if you want to. Me, I'm staying here. Captain Rawson was up ahead. From behind a tree he issued the instructions to both flanks of his company, stiffened their resistance and encouraged them with a rare example of leadership and courage and with stricken eyes he watched the result of that resistance. The enemy machine guns were cutting his company to pieces. Individual sorties ended in failure. In the face of that withering fire, it was impossible to move. Cripes, chattered Private McBride. If only I had a gat in my mitt, I'd take them krauts. Take them one by one. He threw away his rifle and bayonet. This lousy thing ain't used to nobody. Give me a couple of them bombs. Private Wesson looked at him. McBride was breathing noisily between closed, twisted lips. A gat's what I need, he stuttered. I know how to use a gat. Why don't they serve us gats like they do the officers? Bomb in hand, he peered round his side of the boulder. There, some twenty feet ahead of him and a little to the left, his small, beady eyes observed the dead body of a German officer. His breathing made a hissing sound like some run-down engine straining to perform its duty, to struggle on and wheeze and cough until it spluttered out. With the quick and squirmy movements of a weasel, he darted out, dodged from tree to tree, and reaching the dead body, found what he'd hoped to find. A German Luger. Cripes, he breathed. Now I'm all set. His left arm was numb and useless. He ran boldly toward a clump of bushes, dancing under the vibration of a steady tucka 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 Something left his hand. There was a flash and a blinding explosion. About him, the trees and the boulders... The ground he crouched on became a cataract of unseen bullets. Private McBride, turning off at a tangent to the right, went on crazily, the hissing sound of his breathing coming in fits and starts. Again his teeth yanked a pin out of a bomb, again something left his hand, and there was another explosion, and the silencing of another machine gun. He ran forward to complete the destruction with his Luger, shooting with savage accuracy. He turned to the left, something flashed near him. For a second he spun around topwise, then he fell. Captain Rawson, peering round the side of his tree, had seen all that happened. Now he gazed on a little twisted figure and watched the spouts of mud and dirt and twigs dancing round his head, his legs, his shoulders. Actuated by some blind, ungovernable instinct, impulse, Rawson rushed up to a forward tree. From there he reached another. A little distance in front of him McBride lay on the ground, 
In an awful second, unimportant details rose with remarkable clearness in front of Rawson's eyes. The wet leaf sticking to McBride's gray throat, the frayed thread of a missing blouse button, and the man's right hand. It was a jellied pulp. Without doubt it would have to be amputated. What had the little runt sworn to if ever again he held a gat in it? A twinge of pity shot through Rawson, for in that bloody mess of four fingers and thumb was a German Luger. Flinging a grenade at the nearest machine gun, Rawson sprang out, reached his man, and lifting him as easily as he might a child, he protected the puny body with the breadth and width of his own, ran for the shelter of a boulder, staggered, fell to one knee, rose painfully, went on drunkenly, hopefully. Later, much later, Captain Rawson opened his eyes in a dressing station. He had been dreaming of his wife, buried now a year, dreaming that once again he was resting in the blessed security of her arms. A dream. That's all it was. A dream. Across the room, amidst a litter of stretcher cases, a joyous voice hailed him. It was the young, thin-faced lieutenant. His arm was in bandages, and he walked with a limp. He came over and stood at the foot of Rawson's stretcher. Okay, Captain? I guess so. That was a wonderful thing you did, considering everything that little runt had done to you in the past. A wonderful thing, Captain. A wonderful thing. The lieutenant sounded a trifle hysterical. How is he? Rawson asked faintly. He'll pull through, I hear. They cut him up a bit, amputated his arm or something, but he'll pull through. That's good. Still and all, after all he'd done to you a year ago, what made you do it, Captain? Do what? Go out there and risk your life and... I don't know. You don't know? No, I don't know, said the Captain, closing his eyes. What's the use of talking about it? The end. And with that, we take our leave from the front lines of France. I hope you enjoyed this story. This was one of my favorites so far. We had a little bit of everything in here. Action, redemption, maybe even some forgiveness along the way. So that'll do it for this show. If you have any questions for me about the show, you can reach me directly by email at pulpreaderpod at gmail.com. You can find the show on most of your social media go-tos, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, I'm going to wrap it up here. We'll be back for another episode sooner than later next time, I promise. So until then, thanks again for listening. We'll catch you next time.